Well, today is a good day for the for the Alcano Royal Institute. We have uh, another great analyst, and in this case, uh, uh, there is uh, Natalie Tochi uh, here with us. Um, hello, Natalie. Uh, welcome, and, and thank you very much for being here with us. Natalie is a deputy director of the Istituto Affari Internazionali in Italy, and um, she's going to answer a couple of questions uh, from from me. Um, well, Natalie, Natalie. Um, the first question would be um, if you could tell us about the, the, the current situation um, since uh, more or less the, the, the Arab Spring and, and the events that have taken place in the Mediterranean and, and Middle East region. Uh, the Mediterranean and the Middle East are uh, indeed changing in fundamental ways. Um, if you like, and dating back to 2011, uh, we see the way in which the underlying social contract uh, between states and peoples in the Middle East uh, has been broken, and in fact has been broken. Uh, this, uh, if you like, underlying social contract, which essentially rested upon the st strong state providing, if you like, benefits uh, to, to its peoples, but um, if you like, economic benefits in some respect, but ultimately through the strong and repressive state, has ultimately failed to deliver. Now, this was evident in 2011, and of course, since then, the situation has got worse rather than better. So what we've been seeing have been, if you like, uh, instances of state fragility, of state collapse, the proliferation of ungoverned spaces, which is making the, the underlying, if you like, uh, social contract, the break of the social contract, more evident today than it was only a few years ago. Now, on top of this, you essentially add uh, if you like, the ideological uh, vacuum in the region. After the, f the successive uh, failures of Pan-Arabism, of Nasserism, uh, of socialism and of political Islam in the region, you essentially have an ideological vacuum which is being uh, increasingly uh, filled uh, by movements uh, such as Al-Qaeda and, and, uh, and now the Islamic uh, State. Added on to this, we have, if you like, more structural problems which relate uh, to demography, uh, to climate-induced uh, migration and conflict, uh, and of course, if you like, the catalyzing uh, factor which technology has brought in, both in terms of uh, helping the mobilization uh, of populations evident uh, back in the early days of, uh, of the Arab uh, Spring, and of course, uh, today, the use made of technology uh, by uh, criminal groups and, of course, uh, by uh, terrorist groups such as the Islamic State. Well, and the second question would be if you could tell us something about the reaction and the, the current responses uh, from the European Union to, to this event. Now, the European Union is in a process of revision, obviously, of its policies towards the Mediterranean uh, space and, and more broadly North Africa and the Middle East. Now, in some respects, of course, uh, it is clear that the, the, there is a fundamental need for a rethink uh, in EU policies. Uh, if you like, both geographically and conceptually, what was uh, conceived of uh, in the framework of the neighborhood policy doesn't really make sense anymore. Uh, the geography of the region is not the one that we had imagined uh, for many years. It is clear that the links between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa are increasingly tight. It is increasingly clear that the dynamics between the East and the West uh, and in particular the way in which, for instance, uh, Gulf actors are playing an increasingly prominent role uh, in, for instance, the Horn of Africa. Uh, it is, so it is clear that our geography, if you like, have to be rethought. Perhaps the most evident example of this is the fact that, in principle, Syria belongs to the European neighborhood policy framework. Uh, Iraq belongs apparently to a different region. But of course, as we know, there is an Islamic state which is straddling the two. So we have to rethink our geography. Likewise, we have to rethink conceptually the way in which we go about the region. We used to think in the framework of the neighborhood policy that an approach of, if you like, enlargement light uh, was the way forward. Now, it doesn't really make sense uh, to talk about deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with states uh, that are increasingly fragile, if not collapsing. Can we really think about a DCFTA, for instance, with Jordan, mm, apparently one of the front runners uh, in the neighborhood policy? 
as our migration uh, uh, framework is increasingly strained internally uh, by the dynamics unleashed by the Eurozone crisis, externally, of course, in view of the unraveling of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, does it really make sense to think uh, in terms of if you like, the more for more approach uh, within the context of mobility partnerships? Yes, it's clear that there should be a strong push to open up in terms of uh, mobility, but it is equally clear that the, if you like, responses within Europe are of an increasingly, uh, if you like, fortress uh, approach. So all this to say that um, neither does this necessarily mean having to uh, sort of set aside a more transformative agenda for the region, uh, but it is uh, indeed the case of rethinking our approach towards the region in a manner which is not necessarily reproposing an enlargement light method and in a way which actually responds uh, to the underlying developments uh, on the ground. Well, as I said before, it has been a, a real pleasure uh, having you here today. Thank you very much for, for coming to the Elkano Royal Institute, Natalie. Thank you very much.